So good afternoon, students and my colleagues. We are back again, and this time with again a very interesting theme, that is uh, nuclear dimension in India-Australia relations. And this perhaps again is going to be an interactive session, mostly to understand from uh, Ambassador Amit Das Gupta about his perspective on this particular dimension, because as you know that India-Australia relationship obviously has several dimensions. And uh, as per my assessment, nuclear dimension perhaps uh, really has received maximum attention because that in the past has proved to be an impediment in augmenting India-Australia partnership. And uh, to a larger extent, the way things got unfolded in recent times, there seems to have some improvement in mutual understanding in the nuclear sphere, but still we have a long way to go. If you, in fact, want to assess about Australia's uh, capability in the uranium uh, sector, I think it is something very, very important. They started uranium mining way back in the early part of 50s, to be precise, in the year 1954. And uh, they have the second largest uranium reserve in the whole world. And to an extent, again, they have been supplying uranium to uh, a number of countries across the globe. It's a member of nuclear suppliers group. Australia also is a signatory to the NPT, and that is why it has committed not to really acquire nuclear weapon. A lot of things have happened. At the same time, Australia's perception that India, since it's a, it's a non-signatory to the nuclear non-proliferation treaty, there cannot be a very serious nuclear relationship with India, and somehow that has got changed because of Indo-US Civil Nuclear Cooperation Agreement. As you are aware that Indo-US Civil Nuclear Cooperation Agreement is not an agreement only with the United States, but it has paved the way for India to conduct nuclear trade and commerce with all the members of nuclear suppliers group. And that to an extent again depends upon how India has been maneuvering diplomatically, what were those impediments, what were those obstacles. More recently, during our Prime Minister's visit to Australia, India and Australia have signed a bilateral India-Australia Civil Nuclear Cooperation Agreement. And still we have not seen the reflections of those agreements, mainly from the tangible point of view. What is it that Australia has done or what is it that India has asked for? So a lot of these questions really become very, very pertinent in terms of understanding India-Australia nuclear uh, relationship. And obviously what are those uh, areas of concern on part of Australia because they still feel hesitant in supplying uh, nuclear fuel to India. One of the impediments India has is that India requires a uh, lot of uh, nuclear fuel. India does not have sufficient nuclear fuel, and that is why India has not been augmenting its nuclear component in its energy security. If it has to go by the commitment which India has made in the Paris Protocol, I think India certainly has to be moving faster in the field of nuclear as well as renewables. And renewables and nuclear only can uh, save India from uh, becoming uh, less dependent on the fossil fuel. There is no other way by which India can change its course of energy security. So a lot of these questions keep coming, and even if uh, a nuclear suppliers group waiver was given to India, India has not been able to exploit it sufficiently because India so far has got uranium only from Kazakhstan and Australia. There are 48 countries which are part of nuclear suppliers group. They are those countries which have a huge uh, uh, reserve of uranium, but still they are not part of nuclear suppliers group. And from those countries also, India has not been able to harness uh, uh, uranium, which is one of the essential commodity for augmenting nuclear power in its uh, overall energy requirement. So if you see Niger, Nigeria, if you see Kenya, a lot of these countries have a good uh, reserve of uranium, but uh, still India has not been able to get it. So there are a lot of challenges, uh, especially in uh, India's policy in dealing with these issues, as well as uh, the countries which really have those uh, nuclear fuel uh, in their, uh, in fact, reserve, in their uh, stockpile. And that is what, again, one has to see that what ways India-Australia can come together in terms of understanding each other's perception. Though it is uh, believed or it is uh, being acknowledged by the rest of the world that India's credentials are very high in terms of non-proliferation despite not being a signatory to NPT. And if you see the way that things were acknowledged by the United States in the joint statement which India signed in July 2005, which the U.S. acknowledged that India is a responsible player, it has not proliferated. And they openly, in fact, acknowledged in a joint statement that India is a responsible nuclear player with uh, similar uh, advanced technology which the nuclear weapon countries have. 
and that too acknowledgement was that how India, despite having all these, has not proliferated, and that is how, in fact, the relations between India and the U.S. grew. What I mean to say here that in what context India and Australia can really come together in the, uh, in fact, nuclear dimension, and how is that can really help India in moving towards or increasing towards the nuclear component of its energy security. Right now, as you can see from uh, India's uh, energy security constituent, roughly 1.6 to 1.8 percent of its energy comes from nuclear component, and that is not enough. And India really has uh, seen uh, in the past a number of uh, challenges in terms of augmenting its capability in the nuclear sphere, but it has proved to the world that even if a uh, lot of sanctions were imposed to India, because the rest of the world in general, and the U.S. in particular, wanted to cripple India's nuclear industry, and despite all those sanctions imposed by the United States, after it tested its first device in 1974, India really proved highly successful. It became self-reliant. It did pay the price in terms of time and money, but India became self-reliant. So ultimately, it proved to be a boon in disguise. And Australia's insistence all these years, all these decades, that India shall sign the NPT, India shall sign comprehensive test ban treaty, then only they can cooperate with India. All these things basically are still not well understood by Australia. But at the same time, because of this current agreement which India and Australia have signed, that again has to be seen, so in fact, in, in, that has to be operationalized in the real sense, because if intangible does not get culminated in tangible, I think that agreement remains an agreement. So what are steps India shall take in terms of mobilizing Australia in its favor and getting sufficient nuclear fuel should form this part of discourse. What Australia has to do, especially in terms of dispelling their doubts with regard to India's overall strategic ambitions in the nuclear arena, India has been accepted as a de facto nuclear weapon state. This cannot be undermined. This cannot be denied. Even if, uh, as per the definition of uh, nuclear weapon state, India may not be figuring in that definition, which NPT gave. But at the same time, for all practical purposes, India will remain a nuclear weapon state. India basically is willing to sign NPT as a nuclear weapon state, but not as a non-nuclear weapon state. The pressure has been that India has to really sign NPT as a non-nuclear weapon state. But those debates really have taken a different shape now. And a lot of changes which have occurred in the last decade and a half, in particular, since the joint statement signed by the US and India in July 2005, I think obviously there has been a remarkable shift in terms of the approaches which India has and the approaches which the other nuclear weapon states have. So I think with these few words, I would like to really bring this debate on the, uh, on the, the larger policy issues that in what context India has to be responding to these uh, challenges. At the same time, what India has to do in terms of mobilizing Australia in its favor so that India-Australia civil nuclear cooperation agreement obviously gets completely operationalized. So we have, uh, as you know, we have a, a very eminent person sitting here who has seen uh, how India has negotiated various things with Australia in the past, how India has been doing this negotiation with Australia now, and obviously this information and these uh, negotiations which India has done, you would like to objectively analyze. And as you know, there can't be a better person other than uh, Ambassador Ramit Das Gupta to tell us something about these uh, negotiations, these issues, the challenges which India has confronted, the challenges, the responses which India, Australia has made, and how best we can really move ahead where we can see certain, fo certain forward-looking approaches in India-Australia uh, nuclear equation, in the sense nuclear, civil nuclear uh, cooperation. So, sir, uh, again, we welcome you uh, that you were able to come and, uh, uh, in fact, uh, spare time. I know that you, since morning, you have been delivering lecture. But this is, again, as I said, that it's going to be completely interactive mode where I would like uh, Mr. Das Gupta to uh, speak and then I would like uh, Mr. Chari to uh, speak for uh, five to seven minutes and then we'll keep the house open for discussion. Those of you who basically have very specific questions on this issue, please feel free to ask. Try to learn more from this experience because learning comes only when you interact. And that is how the things have to move. So please join me in welcoming Ambassador Das Gupta once again. And over to you, sir. I suppose it's not very often that you are subjected to uh, the same speaker twice a day. And so for that, I apologize. Uh, but um, I think there are two, three elements involved in this. And um, so let me just start off with the first one. What is the relationship between India and Australia? And um, is it really a relationship that over time has been a robust 
and a very strong relationship. In my view, India and Australia are not enemies. They never were enemies. But a lot of people would argue that it, the relationship lacked strategic depth, it lacked substantive content. And that the Australians, if you, if you, many Australians, even if you were to go and speak to them today, will tell you that the relationship is based on three C's, Commonwealth, cricket, and curry. And when I went uh, to, to work in Sydney, I was told, this is it. These are the three C's and um, we have a fantastic relationship. It's a very strange thing, actually, because our concept of the Commonwealth is quite different. India's Republic. Um, Canberra still has a very strong relationship with Her Majesty the Queen of England. We don't. The second, cricket, yes. It's a sporting uh, challenge. We love playing with Australia. Australians love playing with India. And it is there. But do you really base the relationship between a subcontinent and a continent on cricket? And the third is, of course, I must confess, Australian concept of curry is very different from Indian concept of curry, and I would not recommend the Australian curry. Now, that being the scenario, for a long time, what was argued was that we need to shift our vocabulary. From the three C's, we need to move to something called the three E's. And I used to say that the three E's need to be education, energy, and the economy. But having said that, let me take you back a little bit around the time when the Second World War ended, the Cold War began, and whose side are you on became the real matrix on the basis of which countries decided to engage with each other. For reasons that you may or may not agree with, Prime Minister Nehru decided that we would follow the path of non-alignment. And that essentially made, meant that we would try and engage with both sides, because there were really two sides, with both sides, depending on what gave us maximum and optimum advantage. This was not liked by the Australians. And there's a lot of criticism on the position taken by Pandit Nehru that is documented and that is available. So the relationship didn't start off as well as it could have post-independence. At the same time, Australians do remember with enormous gratitude, with significant respect, the role played by and the martyrdom of many Indian soldiers along with Australian soldiers in different parts of Europe where they lie side by side. And I think it's important to recognize that even this sacrifice by Indian soldiers was not big enough for the Australian government to say, you're not with us. Then came the nuclear test. And when the first nuclear test took place, India was treated as a pariah. The language that was used from Canberra was extremely harsh. We had an outstanding foreign service officer in, in Canberra, a person I, I hold in very high regard, High Commissioner uh, G. Parthasarathy, who um, was positioned there and the exchange of correspondence that took place at that time where India decided it was not going to give explanations as to what it did. It had, as I spoke to you in the morning, it had done what was paramount, important, significant 
for its own strategic and national interests. And there was no question of our taking criticism from others and bowing down to it. And this very hard line position taken by Delhi alongside a hard line criticism taken from Canada, uh, taken from Canberra, actually set the tone for what was, I would say, troubled and rough waters. At the same time, it was not that troubled and that rough for New Delhi and Canberra to become enemies. I think what happened was over time, both sides decided not to up the engagement. And what remained was really a kind of lukewarm, non-substantive engagement from two sides. To my mind, this situation continued for quite some time and the Labour government in Australia was very strongly opposed to having any kind of nuclear relationship with India. Within Australia also, I mean, it is a, a continent which, which is referred to as down under, even though some 20, 30,000 years ago, it is argued by some that a tectonic shift took place, which actually moved the continent of Australia, which was linked to the hip with India away. And that movement that took place, the two countries, the landmass which was joined together, shifted apart. The waters that came in between and the population of Australia made many Indians ask themselves, or I believe, the absurd question, how do I engage with a country which has barely 20 million people? Why should I? Why not engage with a country or a continent like, or a landmass like Europe, which has over 300 million people. Do I not get more? The market is bigger. Indians, I think, companies, etc., forgot many things in the process. Here was an economy that was rapidly growing. Here was an economy that had not seen anything apart from GDP growth rate. It was not a country that was facing recession. And in this critical situation, a dramatic event also took place. India and Australia, India and, sorry, Washington, USA, after a long period of sustained dialogue and discussion, and mind you, mind you, one of the great things about Indian foreign policy is that even when governments change, the continuity of foreign policy did not change. It was the government under Prime Minister Vajpayee that began the discussions and it was the government under Dr. Manmohan Singh that concluded the discussions. The same discussions. It's not that there was a reversal of policies. A foreign policy saw a continuity and I think that's a grand, uh, spectacular thing about Indian foreign policy that governments, irrespective of who is in power, actually ensures continuity because strategic national interest does not change and shift purely with change and shift in governments. My reading and our reading was that many parts of the world had for various historical reasons crafted foreign policy in two ways. One, they looked at their core interests, and core meant in terms of those who were geographically, who you enjoyed geographical contiguity with. So if you were physically close to a particular set of countries, they became your core interest, and you had a foreign policy with them. The Germans, for example, looked at their neighbors, Europe. They tried to work closely with that. The same thing happened with the Australians. They looked at what was their immediate neighborhood and worked with that, whether it was New Zealand, Papua New Guinea, Fiji, that was their core interest. And of course, China. 
The second most widely spoken language in Australia is Mandarin. I don't know how many of you knew this, but it really is a fact. And so this, this was their core interest. But then when you talk about the periphery, and I'm talking about physical contiguity, as you move further away, for want of a better English word, I think they outsourced their foreign policy. And they outsourced it to Washington. Many will argue that when the nuclear tests took place, the tests where the Buddha smiled and the Buddha smiled again, many argue that Berlin had no idea about it. No idea about it. And no idea about it till they came to know from Washington. In some cases, people crack a joke that they came to know only when they read the newspapers. This is not how foreign policy is made. I think the ignoring of India, the distancing of India, the non-recognition of how important a partner India can be is critical to our understanding and appreciating what Arvindji has just said. The same thing happened with Canberra. Canberra found that it had taken a hardline position on the entire nuclear issue with India. And all of a sudden, Washington had signed the historic 123 agreement. At that time, the Labour government came under enormous pressure in Australia. And they were told that, look, if you are not going to change your position and if you're going to continue to have rigidity in your approach on this particular subject, you might never have India as a partner, leave alone as a friend. And the shift in policy took place. Canberra decided that it was not going to stick with the rigid position that it had taken. I add to this the most significant historic shift that took place. And that took place in 2014. And it took place when Prime Minister Narendra Modi visited Australia almost 30 years after an Indian Prime Minister had visited Australia. He didn't visit just one city. He didn't just add on Canberra to make a multilateral visit into a bilateral visit. He went and visited four cities. He also added Sydney and Melbourne. And you know what a historic visit that was and the manner in which the Indian community turned up, the manner in which the Australian Parliament reacted to him and the manner in which Prime Minister of that day, Tony Abbott, suddenly found that the visit Prime Minister Modi had gone way beyond the expectations of the Australian government or the Australian public. A slew of decisions were taken at that point of time, which was going to upgrade the relationship into an extraordinarily different tangent altogether. Now in this, this background I think I gave to you to be able to appreciate and understand that when we discuss nuclear issues and when we discuss whether Australia and India should collaborate and cooperate more on the nuclear issue, we need to know the background of the fact that from a relationship which lacked strategic depth we now have a relationship which has significantly shifted in a positive manner. In this relationship, in this matrix, how strong is India's interest in developing a relationship with Australia on nuclear energy? My take on this, my personal take on this, and I'm open to correction, is that Prime Minister Modi wanted to make the specific point that you have to shift perceptions and therefore you have to change the manner in which you deal with partners depending on your strategic interest. 
Mr. Modi was denied a visa by several countries prior, prior to his becoming prime minister. These same countries now wish to sit at the same table with him. And I think that is a dramatic shift. Australia is one of them. And not only one of them, it has joined a large group of people that not only discovered that India is an important partner, but that you can do business with Mr. Modi as the prime minister and the head of this country. When you have a situation like this, I think it becomes strategically important for India to take a call on what all can it chip away on, what all should it build on in order to make that relationship way more than it might appear on paper. There, in my view, given the sentiments that are there in the Australian population, I think the Prime Minister, I think the Prime Minister's office, I think the External Affairs Ministry has worked cautiously and correctly and a position I fully endorse is that you've got A, an agreement from Canberra that we are ready and open for business. B, you've made your point. C, they've withdrawn from their earlier position. And D, I don't think getting or buying uranium from Australia in large quantities is India's immediate priority. I'll leave it at that because I think I've spoken a little longer, but I did have to place into context how a relationship shifted from being, to some extent, antagonistic to a large extent almost close to moribund and peripheral to one which I believe has several pillars of seriously strategic interest and partnership. Willing to take questions and go into the nuclear issue in more detail, should you wish to do so. Thanks. Thank you, Ambassador Das Gupta, for that uh, um, background that you have given. In fact, I was reminded of uh, all the activities that we had undertaken during Atal Bihari Vajpayee's time. And uh, that was also the first time that we put together what we call the uh, India's uh, nuclear doctrine. So this, uh, uh, in this regard, there are two issues that I wanted to flag. The importance of what uh, Ambassador Das Gupta said about dealing with uh, Australia. More importantly, with those countries which uh, uh, have uh, uh, nuclear fuel to offer to India and also our own uh, capabilities that we have built over almost 70 years. The capabilities did not start from say 2000 or 2014 or 2016 or 18. It started way back from 1948, 49, 50s and slowly and gradually we grew and uh, right from the time Homi Jahangir Baba and others started thinking in these terms. Of course, the, the, the bold decision of going in for uh, the test itself goes to Srimati Indira Gandhi and then to Atal Bihari Vajpayee. Both uh, could keep it uh, under wraps, both of them could really do uh, an excellent job because they had uh, political will and also the necessary scientific support. <clears throat> but in, um, uh, like uh, if you go back, uh, Professor Arvind Kumar would be able to throw more light on this. Uh, the what they call the Eisenhower doctrine, right? Eisenhower doctrine of um, uh, atoms for peace. That is uh, the famous uh, 1953 speech that Eisenhower gave. Uh, there are two aspects of it. We will not go into those historical details. 
whether he was really whether us was really sincerely wishing to do away with the warheads part of the nuclear technology and going for peaceful nuclear technology or that was the tactics that they used so that all other countries which would be in the nuclear technology warhead technology race would be probably led by the us on a uh, atom for peace uh, bandwagon so we can somebody can go into those details as to what happened afterwards and all that but then that also has a lot of implications on the cold war and other things so we will not go into those details almost on a similar lines atal bihari vajpayee government also after the pokhran 2 uh, test they they what what they call the self imposed moratorium on conducting further underground test so uh, but since then even then of course there was lot of uh, criticism as to why we should go in for a self imposed moratorium on underground test uh, and also one more issue that we flagged with ourselves was the no first use so while a number of people agree on nfu lot of people had objection especially from the scientific community as to why we should go in for this kind of a total uh, self film post moratorium should we go back on that so with that in view uh, sometime around 2008 2009 uh, india us indo us nuclear deal was signed and 2010 dr manmohan singh the then prime minister initiated what they call was what what was co- then called as the process to revisit india's nuclear doctrine actually if you see the clause 7 of the nuclear doctrine itself says that we have to revisit the nuclear doctrine every 3 years because science and technology is a constant developing aspect of constant developing thing is there so in order to keep with that we should do it and uh, most importantly it was suggested that uh, all this uh, 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 nuclear devices uh, as they call <coughs> have a um, sort of a um, maximize they we we have to constantly maximize the ratio of their capabilities which can be done only through constant uh, experiments of course there are simulation test methodologies but we need not go into those aspects of stimulation te- technology we could go in for a direct underground test also and since then uh, we have also progressed on number of issues like for example agni um, uh, agni 6 right agni 6 which um, has a capacity to carry some 3 ton payload um, and also uh, nuclear devices that is needed but the problem is Uh, are we are we uh, are we uh, technically strong enough to uh, do with what we call the um, uh, velocity and uh, uh, speed related aspects of the agni all these things require constant scientific experiments which cannot always be completed with a simulation formula another issue is uh, those who are in the area of physics would know that these fissile materials also have a tendency to sort of uh, undergo what they call a nuclear a natural decay process so this natural decay process when it sets in at a critical stage the nuclear fissile material becomes incapable of um, providing the Uh, natural requirement as far as the warheads are concerned so these things also need to be tested so that is why in 2014 it was suggested that a new government whichever new government comes should revisit india's nuclear doctrine uh, obviously there was a lot of hue and cry saying that uh, this means you are going back on what atal bihari vajpayee said and then by that time there was a bjp government and then they said your own prime minister said your own party prime minister said that no first use revisiting india's nuclear doctrine does not mean going back on no first use no first use and 
underground tests are two absolutely different things. So we should remember these facts when we talk in terms of dealing with countries which, which are capable of supplying us fuel, especially in the context of Australia. Another important thing that we should do is, uh, which has taken a back seat for a long time, almost as long as 70 years, this whole idea of using thorium as a fuel, which was suggested very far back in 1950, is still uh, thorium um, three cycle, or as they call third stage. So this is still uh, a process or work in progress. I think that is one area where we should, at least students with scientific background and also uh, who are interested in uh, geopolitical aspects of the new nuclear technology should look into this aspect of how thorium can be best utilized for not only atom for peace, because thorium is best suited for atom for peace. So if we really want to carry forward that 1953 doctrine of atom for peace and then to 1998 doctrine, India's nuclear doctrine, and then carry forward the same doctrine to use atom for peace. If we have to do that, we will have to technologically improve the use of thorium as a nuclear fissile material. So these things, I think we need uh, more people like Ambassador Das Gupta to come and visit us more often and create a stimulation for these ideas and these thoughts, which will go into the depth of our understanding of the material and also make be able to make policies for the policy makers in New Delhi. Thank you. I think uh, you have enough for uh, having an interaction because a lot of things have come up. Let me put this in a nutshell. Uh, the way Ambassador Dasgupta put it, I think it was very nice that uh, all these years, in fact, India and Australia were busy in understanding each other and transformation which the world has seen now in this bilateral relationship obviously will take off only when there is more and more of understanding of each other's requirement. The point which he made was that nuclear dimension is, is still important and the understanding which Australians have with regard to India's nuclear requirement, nuclear fuel requirement, uh, is still very limited. So a lot of misperceptions which existed in the past, that really has been dispelled and that is what is the success of India-Australia engagement right now. Australia in a very, I don't know, the, the consignment which has come a couple of years ago in terms of uh, providing uranium to India is very limited because India's requirement is far too many in terms of getting those uranium. India basically always has been experiencing uh, uh, very uh, deep scars of this nuclear fuel because even to, uh, in fact, see that nuclear reactor works at the optimal level, it needs sufficient uranium and that is not uh, existing, that is not, in fact, is existing in India's own reserve. The point which Mr. Chari made again was very useful. Atoms for peace, let me tell you that atoms for peace was not for nuclear weapon states, it was for non-nuclear weapon states. That how the US was trying to bring the rest of the world under their ambit by telling them that these weapons are good for them, bad for others. And they wanted to signal to them that, look, if you give up your ambition of acquiring nuclear weapon, we'll provide you with the nuclear technology, and this nuclear technology will help you in generating nuclear power. And whatever that country will import as a part of nuclear fuel will come under International Atomic Energy Agency safeguard regime. So I think that is very, very important, because you, as you know, the creation of IAEA, really happened much after atoms of Peace statement. And that creation was largely to see that how they could regulate the import of nuclear fuel. Very difficult to even divert one gram of nuclear fuel because you have a lot of technology in place to really keep checking how you are using that. The nuclear fuel, whatever India gets from elsewhere as a part of import, comes under International Atomic Energy Agency safeguard regime. So Australia, if they think that India might divert, is not a correct thinking. Australia has to be open-minded in terms of keeping to their commitment as a part of this bilateral uh, India-Australia Civil Nuclear Corporation Agreement. 
A lot of things need to be done diplomatically. As I said, that even if those countries which have the nuclear fuel, but they have not been able to provide India with this nuclear fuel, there may be certain challenges at the diplomatic level. And India needs it, because India has to augment its nuclear component of its energy security. 1.6% of India's energy comes from nuclear component, obviously has to reach by 2040, at least to the level of 4%. If it doesn't happen, the things again will not be moving towards uh, towards uh, this uh, having less dependency on the fossil fuel. So this is again one very important significant point. I think a lot of things have been said about uh, India's uh, ambitions, India's uh, nuclear test. I am not going to touch upon those. The only thing I will say that the civil nuclear cooperation part of India's requirement is completely different. As you know, India has made a separation plan where India has been able to identify both its civil nuclear facilities and the military facilities. And there is no, in fact, uh, problem in terms of understanding these many segregations. The, the India has been asking for nuclear fuel only for those facilities which are going to be used for generating power. No country will provide nuclear fuel to make nuclear warhead, let me tell you very frankly. So I think that understanding one has to be very clear. No, India is not asking for nuclear fuel to build nuclear warhead. India is asking the nuclear fuel for generating nuclear power. And any gram, even one gram of nuclear fuel will be under uh, safeguard and inspection regime. So that part I want to make it very clear. India, Australia, both these countries have a lot of potential and uh, still it has not been reflected in their uh, larger goal in terms of achieving certain uh, tangible benefit for each other. But at the same time, uh, I think uh, in the days to come, at least the move which has been made, especially after Prime Minister Modi's visit, again has shown certain willingness on part of Australia to change their direction of their foreign policy orientations towards India. But what I was arguing was that this is something which has happened in the last three, four years, is not enough. The thing really has to move at a much faster pace, especially in terms of uh, fructifying this particular bilateral engagement. So those of you who have any questions on this, uh, please, uh, you may please ask uh, Ambassador Das Gupta. You can ask these questions to Mr. Chari. I would like Mr. Chari to come and sit here. Let us really have this uh, very serious engagement because this is something which really we look for in terms of our better understanding to get multiple perspective. And obviously facts will remain facts. So those of you who have any questions, please uh, do identify yourself and then ask your question. Be as specific to the question. That would really be useful for us. We want to get maximum from this another 45 minutes, which would really be uh, able to help us in uh, clearing our doubts and obviously understanding these issues very, uh, very uh, in a clearer fashion. Yes. Um, so I have two questions for you. Uh, so in your talk, uh, you mentioned that India won't be needing uranium from Australia anytime soon. I would request you to please expand on that. And on the same lines, I would also request a comment from you on um, how do you perceive the future trajectory of their uh, nuclear trade relationship. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, my name is Anupama. I'm a PhD candidate at this department. Uh, sir, I wanted to ask you uh, to what extent do you think uh, Australia's perception of India is influenced uh, by United States perception of India. Is there a link there at all? Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. I'm Shilpa. I'm a second year student here. Sir, uh, as we all know, Australia is one of the largest importer of coal for India. As at the same time, Australia and India is coming into a relation with respect to solar energy and nuclear as well. So how do you think the possible negotiation can be happening between these two countries without compromising both economic as well as energy demand of both? Thanks. Thanks so much. So I'll try and combine all questions in my response by first saying that um, is Australia's policy towards India influenced by Washington? I believe it, it was for a significant period of time. But I also believe that there has been a massive tectonic shift a quantum leap, if you like, where Canberra and New Delhi have started engaging with each other far more than they were engaging before. And there is a reason behind this. And that reason is that relationships, bilateral relationships, become robust only when you are able to identify shared concerns and shared aspirations, and perhaps explore 
the possibility of being able to intervene in this jointly. Now, when you, when you are in a position to do something like this, then you don't need a third party or a fourth party or look through someone else's eyes. You're able to engage directly. And I think the massive shift that we saw with Prime Minister Narendra Modi's visit is that there's been a significant amount of interaction between the two countries at the level of heads of, of government taking place directly. We've had a very large number of visits by the Australian Prime Minister to India. Now we're expecting one more to take place. There's been minister, foreign ministers from both sides interacting. Now this is, this is a, a major new development that has been put into the bilateral equation that to my mind reflects that what used to happen is no longer the template of what is happening or is going to happen. So that would be my first response. The second is that this is not a old phenomena. This is a pretty recent phenomena. And strategically, when you are dealing with a, a bilateral relationship that is only now beginning to take roots and grow, I think a strategic choice is made as to whether you should accelerate the pace and introduce elements into this that might slow down the pace of the relationship. And in that, I believe India, New Delhi, has taken a very good calculated, not a risk, a calculated strategy that they will first consolidate security and defense partnerships, look at collaboration in areas of higher education research, including medical sciences, technological advances, et cetera, before they are picking up on areas which could be contentious among the Australian population that I, we are exporting vast quantities of uranium to India, as very rightly asked for by the last question, affecting the, the entire uh, trade equation which is heavily loaded in favor of Australia because we buy coal from them. So are we going to dislodge coal all of a sudden? So I, I believe that in life, um, if, you, if you want to build a robust foreign policy, if you want to build a robust security policy, you need to go one step at a time. You need to be very clear and very categorical in the manner in which you, you approach the issue. You also need to recognize that Australia is not the only country that has uranium or will supply uranium. It has very high quality uranium. You want the uranium. You've also established that Australia has supplied uranium to India. And therefore, when the right time comes, that pipeline will, conclude, will, will follow through. But today, I believe, given the history of the relationship, which, as I said, was not substantive, it is first important to put together the pillars of different components which demonstrates how shared concerns, shared aspirations can bring the two countries closer together rather than rocking the boat. I think I covered all, all the questions that were asked. Have I left anything out? Yeah? Okay. So, uh, sir, when you speak about more robustness in the relationship between India and Australia, is there a possibility that now the two countries are increasingly wanting to converge and become more prominent actors within the entire Indo-Pacific debate? Could that actually contribute to this robustness that the two countries are seeking to achieve for each other? Your question right away rather than waiting for more questions to come. I think you've hit the nail on the head. I think. I think one of the core areas of, let's say, if we are looking at the area of security, defense, etc., the Indo-Pak uh, Pacific is going to be a major point of convergence, and I believe both countries are seriously looking at this particular area. There are major shared concerns with regard to what's happening, what I refer to as the possibility of a Cold War in the Pacific, where the South China Sea's issue, 
There are other concerns that people have in terms of the fact that the footprint of terrorism is not restricted or geographically a contained footprint. It is one which is allowed to proliferate. Technological advances are going to have a massive impact, as I said today morning, that issues like cyber security are, are, are going, can have literally flaws and loopholes in that. If you have not properly firewalled, the implications on defense can be enormous. I believe the two countries are having significant amount of dialogue and discussion and identifying areas of possible cooperation on what I call fundamental, crucial, strategic areas of collaboration. This is not to ignore collaboration in the area of higher education and research, etc., which are also critical. But security, defense, trade relations, investment policies, uh, all of this is going to be uh, areas that we are really going to be looking at in a very robust manner. Uh, sir, um, the nuclear, as the, as the topic itself was, was put, the nuclear dimension remains a key element. But my question would rather be that Australia is also a world-renowned leader in clean coal technology. It's also a leader in rooftop solar and other areas such as that. Is there more potential for both co clean coal as well as rooftop solar than there is for nuclear trade and commerce between India and Australia going forward? I, I personally don't think uh, the energy mix is an either-or. I, I believe that in the area of renewables and in the area of clean coal technology, there has been a lot of discussion and collaboration that's going on. Professor Matt Santamuris of the University of New South Wales is one of the most well-known uh, internationally renowned persons in the area of rooftop cooling and has been doing work with the government of India. One of, the, one of the programs that we do annually with the Energy Research Institute of India, or TERI, is every year uh, we participate in their summit, which is known as GRIHA, which is India's premier sustainable housing and sustainable habitats conference. Uh, we are the only foreign partner university that collaborates in this. And we bring some of our best academics uh, in the area of civil engineering, in the area of environment, um, in, in architecture, to work closely with them. And quite frankly, on Monday, I'm meeting people from, your, uh, from the School of Architecture over here because we're looking at collaborations over there. Most certainly, these are areas in which collaboration is something we look at and something that we would do. But I don't think this is an either or. I think what has happened is when you look at the developmental challenges, uh, countries like India, country, all developing countries are hit by multiple things simultaneously. And so while it's important that we prioritize things, uh, many of the interventions need to be done at the same time with sometimes the same speed. Uh, two questions. The first one is related to uh, a broad sort of geopolitical identity of Australia. Uh, and the second one, um, I think, uh, give me the, allow me the opportunity to carry over from your morning uh, lecture. Uh, uh, the first one, I, I, uh, as we are discussing about Indo-Pacific, uh, if, um, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, um, I think the shift that has come to Australia broadly as in its uh, identity, um, uh, you know, which is informed both by history and geography. So if you look at the geographical reality of Australia, you know, it has, rem uh, it has always been an Indo-Pacific reality or Indo-Pacific country. But I think during the Cold War and with the Unjust Treaty and all those things, I think, and with the Commonwealth, I think what change, what kind of a change or a realization which has come is an Australia which was seen or perceived as an outback of the British Commonwealth has come to some sort of like accept its real geopolit geographical identity of really being at the heart of Indo-Pacific. And then 
do you maneuvering its relationship with that change geopolitical and geographical reality uh, geopolitical identity reality and engage uh, with a lot of like asia pacific countries and i think that's really the dramatic sort of a shift that we need to understand in terms of engaging with australia and uh, developing shared broad you know positive convergences that is one i want your comment on that the second one is uh, for the benefit of all of us who try to study uh, the practice but also try to study the this emerging discipline of public diplomacy as such and you talk a lot about technology share in the morning uh, my question comes to the idea of the fact that in public diplomacy if i'm not wrong uh, the major question is really i think about what is the medium and what is the message so in terms of india's public diplomacy as we look at the identity of india and in terms of what cultural diplomacy nation branding which comes under the larger rubric of public diplomacy how do we how do you see the change in the medium impacting the message and also the continuity of the message of what india is to tell our story so in the reality of a heterogeneous india how do you make sense of a of a more concrete message of what india is how do you handle diversity while trying to project a message which can be passed down and which would be understood understood and in that process what is the role of listening and not only telling how how much do we listen not only to the external audiences which is really the crux of public diplomacy but how much do we listen to our internal audiences in terms of structuring our message and choosing the medium to pass that message thank you sir i think these are two uh, two very strong uh, and very um, detailed elements on which an entire talk can be crafted um Uh, let me just try and see uh, whether I succeed in 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 being able to to respond to to firstly your comment and secondly your question. To on your comment, let me say that in all fairness, I think ignoring each other was a mutual failure. I think, in as much as New Delhi may sit down and say. canberra ignored us i think in all fairness india ignored canberra and um it was so easy to ignore i mean it was far away it was some 20 21 20 million people today it's 23 million people is that a market you go and have a talk with businessmen they say how do i sell to 23 million people i mean why not sell to 350 million people the pure logic the fact is that it was a far faster growing and a far more robust economy it was looking at high value goods none of this really none of this really registered because we ignored them we saw them as you said out back cricket players uh, our views were based on crocodile crocodile dandy uh, you don't build foreign policy on this also if it takes 30 years for an indian prime minister to visit uh i think that's a telling message uh so i i believe a there is it it is important to realize that the strategic shape of the world is dramatically evolving and dramatically changing and as a consequence areas like the indian ocean the pacific combining the two have become new concepts because of new challenges and new threats and also new realities people are talking in terms of you know we are looking at the emergence of the asian century now if that is going to be actually true if that is going to be true how can you ignore the indo pak pacific region completely you cannot second i think australia also recognizes that the welfare of its own people is critical but dependent significantly on the interaction interface it has not only with existing partners 
but with new partners. And I think the relation to the visit of Prime Minister Modi to that extent, I would say, was very opportune. It was because its time had come. And all of a sudden, you put into the entire equation the new variable of here is a new country with whom I have not had the kind of partnership I've had before. What can I get out of it mutually? And I, that would be my comment. And I think uh, multiple things have coalesced in this to be able to justify and to, in fact, um, to support a strong India-Australia strategic partnership. On the second point, I'd like to say that what is important is no, not simply the message and the medium. If you pardon my, my uh, saying this, I also think it's important for us to ask ourselves, who are we talking to? And therefore, if you say, is it import not important for us to listen, I think audiences change. There is no such thing as a homogeneous audience, that the same message applies to everybody. And I think the dramatic shift of Indian, India's public diplomacy is that it did not just target external audiences. Please, please remember that for years, for decades, actually, seven decades almost, we decided that foreign policy would be made in New Delhi. And in Delhi, we consulted with our friends who were in Delhi. But you decided a foreign policy which was going to impact Nepal, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and Maldives, but did not consult West Bengal, Orissa, UP, Tamil Nadu, who were directly going to be impacted. So the public diplomacy also means talking to our own people, explaining to our own people what is foreign policy, why are we doing what we are doing. And unless we do that, neither the message, nor the medium, or the target audience would work. So do we need to listen? It is only on the basis of listening that you craft messaging. Because if you listen and you're told, I'm sorry, I don't understand your relationship. I don't understand why you're doing this. Then no matter how much messaging you do, it's not really going to work. So does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. It was a very informative speech. So I was just wondering, the influence of China has increased recently quite a lot in Australia, especially in education and real estate. So I was just wondering, is it impacting Australia's reluctance in engaging with India? It has, um, in my view, enhanced Australia's interest in engaging with India. And quite simply because Australia recognizes that it never works to put all eggs in one basket. And quite frankly, um, when you take Australia and you take China and you take India, if I was an Australian diplomat, I would build a strong relationship with India without foregoing my relationship with China. Because I have to work in maximizing my national interest. That has to be the core objective. If on the other hand, you were to see, for example, coronavirus, what has the coronavirus done? The number of Chinese students coming into Australia and the higher education space has suddenly fallen because of travel restrictions. This means that there is going to be an increased attention provided in trying to get more good quality Indian students into Australia. So I think it's a win-win situation that countries go for. They don't always win all the time, uh, but it's never a zero-sum game. You cannot say, I'm going to build a relationship with India because I'm going to break my relationship with Beijing. It doesn't happen. And in foreign policy, and with the manner in which, as I said, the strategic shape of the world is shifting, I don't think you can afford to have enemies because that's bad foreign policy. 
I think what you need to do is to, is to build robust relationships with as many countries as possible without compromising on your national strategic and security interests. My name is Vineet Krishnan. I'm a research assistant and a PhD candidate here at the department. Uh, now, sir, you spoke about the transformative effect of the 2014 visit of, uh, of our Prime Minister. Uh, however, I mean, I was in Australia in 2009 when there was the in incidence of quite a lot of attacks on Indian students happening in Melbourne and in other places. Um, and once I did come back, I was there on an educational exchange, and once I did come back, there was significant amount of Australian investment in Indian media and in, in uh, portraying Australia, uh, public diplomacy outreach of Australia in India. Uh, now, in that five-year period between 2009 to 14, how much of a success do you think uh, it is from the part of Australian public diplomacy that the relationship between India, which had hit a, hit a sort of a low in 2009, bounced back that quickly? And um, secondly, um, we've spoken quite a lot about what India expects or India wants to get from Australia or from this engagement. Um, what do you believe, sir, are the key, uh, um, uh, the key issues that India want, uh, that Australia wants to get from India or to seize from India? It, it, it sort of is a very nostalgic question for me, the first one. I was the Indian Consul General in Sydney from 2009 uh, till 2012. And, um, yeah, I, I saw through a very difficult period um, with the so-called attacks on Indian students. Um, and, uh, but I was blessed in being in Sydney, uh, which um, really didn't see the volume of attacks that took place in Melbourne. The person who's the High Commissioner designate of Australia to India was the New South Wales Premier, which is uh, their, their nomenclature for Chief Minister, um, uh, Barry O'Farrell, and prior to that, Christina Canelli, and prior to her, Nathan Rees. Um, all three from, from the state of New South Wales, a fantastic job. Um, I, I am humbled at the fact that it was only because of their incredible support that Sydney, if you compare with Melbourne, actually was a shining example of governance. Um, but even one attack is one attack too many. And I believe there was a recognition that brand Australia suffered. And there was massive brand damage. And you and I know that uh, when someone is hurting, someone else is really happy. And one of the things that would happen as Consul General is that I would get phone calls from education institutions in Canada, in the US, in UK, saying, you know, your students are being attacked in Australia, don't worry about it, just send them to Canada, US, and UK. Now, this perversity that happens was not uh, something that Australians were not aware of. They realized this. But what Australians did, and I, th I think one needs to give credit for this, is that at one stage you had this huge India uh, media, particularly one particular channel, which decided that all Australians love to do is to hate Indians. And so a lot of, you know, racism, et cetera, discussion took place. I don't believe that all the attacks that took place were racist. I believe the majority of attacks that took place were law and order attacks. People were going home late at night. People were carrying uh, very expensive items, um, MacBooks and iPhones and cash. Many of them had worked in illegal establishments, got paid in cash, um, and they, they were caught at the wrong time in the wrong place. This does not justify an attack. But what I'm saying is to equate that um, and say that it is a racist attack is saying two plus two is equal to five or six or seven. And quite frankly, 
I think the reaction and response that Australia demonstrated uh, should teach us many lessons. And one of them is that they recognized brand Australia needed brand recovery. Now, you and I know, and, 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 and that any management student will tell you, building a brand takes a long time. Establishing that brand takes time. Brand consolidation is very difficult. But once you've done all this, you have brand recall, and then it flows. But if you have brand damage, your fall from grace is dramatic, immediate, and brand recovery takes a very long time. And in less than five years, uh, the number of Indian students going up to, going to Australia has once again recovered. And that is because the Australian government put into place a series of robust, a series of transparent, very strong measures that not only ensured safety, security, etc., of the Indian students, but at the same time, it knocked off dodgy agents, dodgy recruitment partners, and non-genuine students. Do some slip through the cracks? Yes, they do. But is the system alert? Yes, it is. So I would say that there are a lot of positive lessons to learn from this. And um, it is a period that I would say in, in, in a very perverse kind of way. You, don't, you should not have attacks on anybody in order to build that relationship. But actually, the relationship saw a sea change and grew. What is it between India and Australia? I mean, what India wants, what Australia wants. I mean, what I said to you was actually drawn from the joint statement that was issued by both countries after Prime Minister Modi and Prime Minister Tony Abbott met. So it is, it is actually a mutually shared interest is what I've shared. What India and, 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 uh, can, what India and Australia are, are looking at, and m much of it has been put into place already, is that they have heightened defense and security engagement. And I think uh, that, that is a unique um, development. Uh, the role of, of both governments and departments has been enhanced. They have their interactions and their meetings and their strategic discussions on, on a very large number of shared concerns has, has, has gone up significantly. Um, and, and, and I think that's, that's, that's something that both, both countries want. Um, we, have, we know that uh, certain relationships are also discussed um, when other leaders meet. And you know when President Trump visited uh, India recently, um, apart from the bilateral India-US kind of discussions, one of the areas that came up is to invigorate and make sure we strengthen Quad. Now, Quad includes countries other than India and Australia, which includes actually Japan and Australia. And um, I think, therefore, when you, you, you look at where does this relationship stand in 2020, I think significant, at a significantly better space than it stood at 2009. And it has taken off, leapfrogged, from 2014. What you do need, and this I think is important, is that you have to chip away, consolidate, build on the relationship. And I'm really hoping that when um, the Australian Prime Minister visits India, which got deferred because of, of the coronavirus, um, and, and um, uh, that when he does visit India, uh, that it would be another historic visit. So let me acknowledge that uh, this interaction again was very useful for us because at least we have some learning on that where does India and Australia, where do India and Australia stand in the current context in terms of their bilateral relationship. Things have come a far uh, way in the sense that both these countries, uh, both these in the countries have understood each other's requirement in the changing dynamics of geopolitics. A lot of positive developments are being witnessed. It's not that India and Australia are at the same pace which it used to be in the early part of the first decade of the century. There are changes in the political dimension. 
in terms of their bilateral approaches. There are changes in the economic dimensions. As you know, the trade and commerce also is featuring very prominently. And more importantly, I think India and Australia coming together and working in Indo-Pacific, that itself speaks volume, especially in the context of their changing perception. It's not that these two countries alone are working in Indo-Pacific, as uh, Ambassador pointed out. There's a quad which again is getting strengthened, and that is perhaps one of the very important symbolic messages to the rest of the world about the, the need to have a very fair and uh, the rule-based security architecture in the Indo-Pacific region. So each country, whether it is the US, India, Japan, or Australia, they share the same concern with regard to their approaches to Indo-Pacific. The other aspect of the debate, which again uh, got, uh, in fact, salience right now, that was the increasing influence of China. I think any country, if their influence gets increased in country B, the country B will look for certain alternative. There was a survey done in Southeast Asia, <clears throat> and this survey was very interesting, because across all the countries in Southeast Asia, China's influence kept growing all these decades. And this survey was that whether they would like to work with China or they would like to work with India. And the survey suggested that all these countries obviously voted for India. So it's, it shows that how a country which really has got their influence in a particular geopolitical region, how that region really looks for an alternative. And this is what that survey spoke about. So I think this is a, this is a high time for India to understand the, the need for uh, changing its certain uh, policy direction and see that how best it can work with Australia in a very constructive manner. Nuclear dimension is one of the dimensions. I think there are too many other dimensions where India and Australia have to work together. And the potential which these two countries really are uh, really uh, understanding that they have the potential, how best they can harness this potential, that becomes a part of their uh, strategy in the current context. I think all of you really raised very important questions. It didn't really restrict to the nuclear debate. It got expanded to many other areas, and that is what is the need of this particular uh, panel. And obviously, we have learned from this interaction from uh, multifaceted dimensions, whether it was to do with the political dimension or economic dimension or diplomatic dimension or a strategic dimension. I think each dimension was covered. So the purpose of this particular uh, discussion and interactive session has been realized. So let me, again, on the behalf of the Department of Geopolitics and International Relations, thank Ambassador Amit Das Gupta and also thank Mr. Chari for making some of these very invaluable comments because each of these comments really help us in terms of knowing the perspective is the, the, the perspective is they have on these many complex areas. So please join me in thanking Ambassador Das Gupta and Mr. Chari once again.